Continuing on with the TMCC Library Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Michaela, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Procopio. <laughs> it's fine, you got it. <laughs> uh, Michaela is the Digital Director for the U.S. Army Women's Museum. Since January 2021, Michaela has been responsible for running their virtual programs for schools and organizations across the U.S. Uh, she has also created new programs for the museum, including Spies in Disguise, Soldiers in Skirts, and currently one on Charity Adams and the 6,888. Uh, Michaela has a BA in History from Michigan State University and a Master's in Public History from a, the American University. She is currently a PhD candidate studying the history of the Holocaust at Gratz College. From the beginning of our country, women fought right alongside their male counterparts, helping to create the United States of America. Follow the journey of American women in a variety of different roles from an early camp followers to spies for the army, to even dressing up and impersonating a man to help fight in our original war for independence. So without further ado, I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Michaela. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, that was a little bit about my bio and then uh, just an introduction of the program. Uh, the program runs about 45 minutes to an hour give or take, uh, depends on how many questions uh, we have or how uh, interesting we'll get into these women. Um, but I'll just do a little background on the museum. So as you can see, this is the front of our building, the U.S. Army Women's Museum, uh, which is a long title, but uh, pretty much tells you what we're all about, right? We are interested in the history of women that have served in the U.S. Army kind of well before they were even officially recognized, right? So the program that we're going to talk about today is dealing with the Revolutionary War. And of course, women are not going to be allowed to serve in any type of military fashion until World War II, uh, unless they're serving in the Army Nurse Corps. But we still like to include those stories as well. What is also very interesting about our museum is that we're the only museum that tells this specific set of women's stories. So if you were to look for the counterpart of women that served in the Navy or women in the Air Force, they don't necessarily have their own museum separate from like the national history of that branch, right? So there's a National Navy Museum, there's a National Marines Corps Museum, there's a National Army Museum, right? But the Army Women's Museum is the only women-centric version of that kind. Although there are museums that will focus on women who were wasps, right? Uh, they have a museum in Texas. So there's kind of lots of things about that, but that is kind of our uniqueness. We are located on a military base. Uh, the museum is south of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and actually we have just undergone a name change. Uh, the museum used to be located on Fort Lee. Fort Lee was one of the nine um, Southern military bases that was undergoing a name change to no longer be named after a Confederate general. We received our name changing ceremony at the end of April, and now we are proudly Fort Greg Adams, which I'm happy to talk a little bit about at the end if anybody is interested in that as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and start. And the first couple of slides will be a little easy and I'll kind of try to brush through them because it's just a really short background so that we're all kind of familiar uh, where we're going and heading into it before I start to talk specifically about the women and their roles. So of course, we're all very familiar with kind of the main parts of this story, right? George Washington, that we're talking about the Revolutionary War today. And so in that regard, we're talking about what is going to be this fight for independence among the 13 colonies and uh, the British Empire, the Continental Army or the Patriots, which I'll use interchangeably, are led by General George Washington, who becomes our first president against um, King George III and the British. Uh, and I always start kind of with this image because this is a very well-known, famous image that is attributed to the Revolutionary War. Right. This is a retelling of George Washington crossing the Delaware River on his way to attack a uh, Hessian encampment, uh, uh, which would be a surprise attack on Christmas morning. And so I use this because we start out with a lot of different things that come up in this program. We ha heavily rely on primary documents at our museum. So 
paintings, newspapers, photos, um, things like that. Although the documents become less, more and more scarce the further back in history you go. So we have a lot more primary documents around Vietnam or World War II than say we do about uh, the Revolutionary War. So we try our best to supplement with other primary source documents if we don't have ones relating specifically to women. So what uh, I wanted to do really quickly right now is talk about the women's roles uh, that they would have held in colonial life. And I'll highlight a couple of artifacts that we have in our collection that are very kind of unique. Um, so women in colonial life had a very specific sect of what they were allowed to do. Uh, when I do it with school groups, we usually brainstorm, right? What are the primary roles or the, the daily jobs that women would have had in colonial America? And we basically come down to the same things, right? The running of the household, anything that has to do with the home, the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, um, taking care of the children, right? Taking care of the family, anything that can be done within the home is going to be a woman's task. Um, this is the same for women all across kind of the gauntlet, right? So whether you're living on a farm in the North or a plantation in the South or a home in the city, you're still relegated to these roles. So even for wealthy white women who lived on a home that had enslaved individuals, they are still doing the running of the house, right? Just because they have enslaved individuals on their plantation doesn't mean that they're using that kind of workforce to go out and get their own job, right? They're still overseeing it. And this will come into play later when we kind of talk about the majority of the way that women were involved in the Revolutionary War. So all of our artifacts up here have to really do with women, and they would have been used in their day-to-day -day life, um, most generally uh, in the kitchen. Um, many of them had one purpose, right? They were made specifically for one job um, and they didn't do anything aside from that one job. And so I just kind of want to highlight some of them because they're very interesting artifacts. Um, of course, very commonly, you know, we have the candle holder, right? In the upper right, this is a tea strainer, um, which then I'll start with this one right here, um, which is a tea brick. Uh, so when we think of, our tea now, which comes in loose leaf form. Uh, that's not exactly how tea arrived in the early colonies. It was placed into a mold and then it was kind of let out to dry. So it would create this brick. And so when you needed it, you could pull off a little square and you could put it in your strainer or directly into your teacup and pour hot water over it. And the tea, of course, is very closely associated to the American Revolution, right? It always makes us think of the Boston Tea Party, but tea had kind of this uh, other effect for women as well. Tea is going to really be kind of the first step for how um, women are going to show if they are either loyal to the British or if they are following with the Patriots. And that's because women primarily are the ones drinking tea, right? At social events, gatherings, afternoon tea, and for many women, the boycotting of tea meant that they were aligning with uh, the patriots, that they were uh, not happy with the British monarchy. And so to do that, they would refuse tea. And it was common for them to turn their teacup down and put their spoon across it and say something to the effect of, thank you, but I will take no tea. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to see how tea was very much integral to a women's life and how it was also kind of their own little form of resistance in this gathering of a revolution. Then down here on the bottom left, we have something very interesting. It's one of my favorite artifacts. Uh, it is what I like to refer to as a colonial toaster. Um, I don't think it really has a more um, proper name. Um, we just we call it a colonial toaster because if we called it a toaster, it's not what we think of as a toaster today. Uh, it's quite long. It's made out of metal. Uh, you would set it near the fire and you would cut your bread, right? And you'd put your bread into the slots and it would heat one side. And then when it was ready, you would use your foot and you would kick it and those little wheels would turn and it would toast the other side. And then you could pull it back and get out your newly toasted uh, bread. So, uh, you know, something that has completely fallen out of use because that is not how we toast our bread today anymore. Um, 
And so I always kind of think about these very specific objects that had one job and how they very much kind of fall fall out of use with like the evolution of these new items, right? And so to think about the time and the effort that went in to make that a uh, colonial toaster uh, and now it's essentially obsolete. So the reason that I spend so much time kind of talking about women's roles is because it's important to understand their background and their station when the Revolutionary War starts. And we get very caught up with the title of this program, which sounds very fun and fancy, Spies in Disguise. Um, but to remember that that is very much going to be the minority for women in this period. And that the majority of the ways that women are involved in the Revolutionary War, I'm going to talk about right now. And it's something that women in the military will actually continue to use for over 150 years, right? It's really not until the 1990s that women are actually going to be involved in active combat. And so I'll go back to that in a second. Okay. So I am, do have to apologize for this image, but I have a feeling that you guys might understand this a little bit more than my other groups. Um, we at the museum are also have to deal with digital archives. And sometimes when old primary source documents are digitized or uploaded, they are not always uploaded in the best pixelation, right? Sometimes it's the best we can do based on the equipment, how old it is, the, the file that it goes up on, Anyway, et cetera, that has happened to this uh, photograph and that's kind of why it is so grainy and it's hard to see. It's just the way that it was uploaded and it's just the way that we kind of took that collection. And so uh, I use it because this image is so important for one reason. This image is meant to be a retelling, a reenactment of one of Washington's military campsites, right? It's obviously outside, it's in the winter, there's snow on the ground, there's Washington over here with his wife, there's injured soldiers, there's a fire, right? We're in the midst of war, they're at their campsite. But what's really interesting about this painting that we don't find in others is that there are women included in this painting. Um, and they're kind of just there as these spectators listening to George Washington. And we really catch on to this because this isn't common in other paintings, right? Of paintings of military campsites, of reenactments. Why are there women in this painting? What are they doing there? Um, it makes sense for Martha Washington to be there because we know that Martha went to visit George quite a bit. She was very commonly cited as being at Valley Forge in diaries and letters. But to have women there as part of this campsite is unusual. And so when we find this photo, this is actually not, not necessarily primary source verification, right? Because this painting was not done at the moment that it was happening, right? It's not a camera, it's not a photograph. But it tells us that there was enough of women at these campsites that we can take this as a secondary type of evidence that women were there. And so this is the primary way that women are involved in the Revolutionary War. They are involved in something called camp followers, or what I will also term as support roles. And we're going to come back to that idea of support roles uh, later at the end of the program. Women served vital roles in camp life during the American Revolution. And as their husbands and brothers or sons joined Washington's army, the women oftentimes followed their men to battle. Because they essentially have two choices, right? Especially depending on where they live. If they decide to stay home while their husband goes off to war, they are then responsible for the running of the home, right? Uh, whether it's a farm, whether they're in the city, whether it's a plantation, they are now directly responsible. And that's also difficult because they're not making any type of income, right? The sole income is coming from the man. They're also under threat of the British army, right? So uh, open to the quartering act of having soldiers live in their home, right? Of being kind of around, of raided if they take the livestock, all of these things. And so for many women faced with these two choices, they decide that the safer option is to actually follow their husband. And many of them do. And for those of them that have children, they take their children along with them to these campsites. And most of their jobs uh, include the basic running of, of life, right? I think we tend to forget 
uh, when we talk about the military, that to have a really well-functioning army, you have to take care of all of these other logistical things uh, before you can go off and fight, right? So find, having supplies, finding somewhere to live, cooking, laundry, medicinal care. And these are things that the Continental Army is not well equipped for at the beginning of this conflict. And they're also fighting the largest um, military power in the world at this time. So the women are going to take on these support roles, right? The laundry, the cooking, the cleaning, taking care of the soldiers, providing food. Their jobs as support for the soldiers were so important that the military forces ended up allotting these women their own food rations and regulated their work as much as the regular soldiers. Excuse me, most of the women that were considered camp followers were often wives who took their children and followed their husbands. Some of the women were widows or became widowed uh, during the war, but they ended up following the army because they faced poverty due to the war. George Washington uh, has mixed feelings about all of these women uh, following his soldiers. He considered them to be a hindrance to the army's movements, uh, writing in a letter that the multitude of women in particular, especially those who are pregnant or have children, are a clog upon every movement. However, he also realized that if he was restricting women, he risked massive desertion by his soldiers. And so ultimately he allows the women to stay and the women who accompany the Continental Army end up serving a very important role in the daily operations of camp life. Um, so now we're gonna move on to like the very specific individual women. Uh, who most of all either fall into the category of spy or in disguise. Uh, I did ask uh, Suzanne about um, any of their DAR ancestor numbers, which I have. Um, so if you're interested, I'll just share those or I'll put them into the chat at the end of the program. Okay. So women served other vital roles during the revolution. And one of the ways was as a soldier because most women or no, not most, because all women were not allowed to serve in combat. Some women disguised themselves as men to fight for the cause. And one of the most famous individuals who did that was Deborah Sampson. Deborah Sampson is supposedly, according to historians, the only woman to fight in the regular Continental Army. And this is kind of a loaded sentence because that doesn't mean that she was the only woman, right? She's the only one that we have actual tangible physical records of, right? The only one that we know for sure based on evidence that she disguised herself, impersonated a man, served in the war, and then was found out. There were most likely other women that did do this, um, maybe through a different route than Deborah Sampson, right? But if they were able to be successful, uh, if they, you know, evaded discovery and then never talked about it, or if they were unfortunately killed in battle and just uh, mass buried with other soldiers, their stories are lost to history. And so that's why we kind of tie this supposedly onto Deborah Sampson. Deborah walked to Worcester, Massachusetts, 75 miles from her home and enlisted as Private Robert Shirtliff. At one battle, Deborah took a musket ball in the side, but got up and kept moving to avoid the medics. This musket ball stayed inside Sampson until the day she died. Unfortunately, Sampson was discovered to be a woman when fever hit the city of Philadelphia and she was admitted into a hospital ward unconscious. At this point, Deborah Sampson had served a year and a half in the Continental Army and was given an honorable discharge in November of 1783. She ended up receiving a pension from the Massachusetts government and then later the federal government granted her a lifetime pension. Deborah Sampson died at age 67 in Massachusetts. 117 years later, during World War II, a Liberty ship was launched named after Deborah Sampson honoring America's only female regular soldier. Okay, uh, this next woman, as, as for most of these, we don't have actual photos of what these women would have looked like. We rely on paintings, which for some of them we have, some of them we don't. 
Deborah's was a statue. Uh, this woman's is a drawing. This is Prudence uh, Wright, uh, Prudence Cummings Wright. Uh, she is famous and well regarded for being the leader of the only um, militia minute women instead of what we might know in revolutionary history as minute men. Um, she marries David Wright, who is a stalwart Whig and an avid supporter of independence. They settle in Massachusetts, where they become leaders of the cause. Uh, David, her husband, along with other patriotic men in their town, responded to the war's first shot at Lexington, and they end up marching to a nearby town to intercept British troops. This essentially means that this small town of Pepperell, Massachusetts, is completely uh, left without any men. Um, the youngest are going to be small boys, but it is essentially at this point a town made up entirely of women. Prudence decides to spearhead an ingenious venture for the women left at home, a female militia. They dub themselves the Minute Women, and Prudence is elected as militia's captain. These 30 to 40 women, dressed as men, shouldered muskets and pitchforks, and they marched to Jewett's Bridge. And this is a picture here of Jewett's Bridge, which is the only kind of entryway into the town. And this is most likely where advancing British troops would have entered the town at. It's here that the Prudence Wright Guard, as they call themselves, plan to intimidate the approaching red co coats. The courageous women, disguised as men, successfully stopped the British, captured several soldiers, and intercepted vital dispatches regarding future British troop movements. To this day, there's a marker near the bridge that honors the event, reading, Near this spot, a party of patriotic women under the leadership of Mrs. David Wright of Pepperell in April 1775 captured Leonard Whitting, a Tory, who was carrying treasonable dispatches to the enemy at Boston. She is often remembered in memory of the captain of the bridge guard. Um, there is also a really fascinating children's book about Prudence Wright, um, which is how I uh, discovered her. So I always kind of think that's interesting. It's called Prudence in the Minute Women. Um, and I'm happy to find the author for you if I have it. Our next lady is Margaret Corbin. Um, Margaret Corbin's a little bit of a trick question because I always ask, you know, if she was in disguise or if she was a spy. Um, and she's a little bit of both kind of, um, but she's also more of a camp follower. Margaret Corbin, unlike uh, Deborah Sampson, often did the work of a soldier without having to enlist as a man. Um, and that sounds a little tricky and hopefully it makes sense in a second. Margaret was one of the women who followed their husbands with the Continental Army, and she often served alongside her husband during battles. She was the first woman to receive a military pension. Her husband, John Corbin, joined the Pennsylvania military, and Margaret left with her husband as a camp follower, doing the cooking and cleaning for the soldiers. In many cases, especially on this particular case of November 15, 1776, Margaret dressed in her husband's clothes and joined her husband in the Battle of Fort Washington in New York. There, she helped him load his cannon, and when he was killed during the battle, she heroically took over firing the cannon against the British. Other soldiers commented on Captain Molly's steady aim and sure shot. She was unfortunately hit by enemy fire during the battle, which nearly severed her left arm, which she was unable to use for the rest of her life. Margaret struggled financially after the war. The Continental Congress, in recognition of her brave service, awarded her with a lifelong pension. Margaret Corbin died near West Point before reaching age 50. In 1926, her remains were moved from an obscure grave to the West Point Military Cemetery, where she was buried with full military honors. This is a picture on the left of her gravesite at West Point. She is hailed as the first woman to take a soldier's part in the war for liberty. Um, Margaret Corbin is really interesting, and you may have caught it when I read about Captain Molly. Um, Margaret Corbin and another woman, uh, Mary Ludwig Hayes, are thought to be the two real women that made up the composite of Molly Pitcher. 
Um, Molly Pitcher was not a real woman uh, during the Revolutionary War. She kind of grew out of uh, the actual work and efforts of these two very real women, Margaret Corbin and Mary Ludwig Hayes. Um, so if you were ever interested or ever learned about Molly Pitcher when you were younger, part of her is based on Margaret Corbin. Ooh, excuse me. Okay. Women served in one other capacity that we're going to talk about today, and that's serving as a spy. And these two women served as spies for George Washington and the Continental Army. Women tended to be more successful and better at hiding than their male counterparts because men didn't suspect women. Lydia Barrington Darrow, who uh, is on the left, she lived in Philadelphia, and her home was used to house several high-ranking British soldiers. Dara regularly spied on soldiers' meetings under the guise of bringing food or lighting the fire. The information that she overheard, she would then write in a special shorthand and then hide it under the cloth-covered buttons on her son's coat. Her son would then take the messages to his older brother, who was serving in the Continental Army under George Washington. The drawing on the left is a fictionalized image of Lydia's most well-known spying. On December 2nd, 1777, the British ordered the Dara family to stay in one room while they held a meeting in the house. Lydia hides in a closet to spy when she overhears that the soldiers are planning a surprise attack on Washington's army in White Marsh, Pennsylvania for December 4th. That night, Dara leaves the city with the excuse that she needs to get flour from a mill outside of the city. Once outside of the city, she meets up with Patriot soldiers and hands over a message about the impending attack. Lydia's bravery and cunning were crucial in helping to ensure that this attack did not end in a massacre. Our other lady, Anna Smith Strong, also had a very ingenious way to pass on messages to the Patriot. Uh, Anna Smith Strong is thought to be one of the only women in George Washington's Culper spy ring. Her job was to signal her fellow spy that she had information ready for him to pick up. So she would hang her laundry out to dry in plain sight of British soldiers. Anna Smith Strong would hang a black petticoat or skirt along with a certain number of white handkerchiefs. The black petticoat signaled that a message was ready to be received and the handkerchiefs would relay the predetermined location where the message was hidden. Um, and then, of course, today I've been really um, kind of heavy on women that worked for the Patriots or the Continental Army, uh, and that, that's just not the case. Women did not just spy uh, for the Patriots. Many women were loyal to the British cause uh, and helped the British Army uh, during the war. Anne Bates uh spied for the British during the Revolutionary War. She was a teacher in Philadelphia who was recruited by the British Major Drummond. Uh, disguising herself as a peddler, she infiltrated George Washington's camp in White Plains, New York. And while she was there, she was able to obtain numbers of soldiers, guns, cannons, and locations of their weapon stockpiles, which she then brought to Drummond he stated that her information was by far superior to every other intelligence. Um, and then to kind of wrap us up a little bit, right? We all know how the Revolutionary War ends. Um, it is going to be a victory for the Continental Army. Um, they will declare their own dependence and set up their own government. Unfortunately, less than 100 years later, they're embroiled in another conflict, this one between the states. Like in the Revolutionary War, women also served in the Civil War, but most of them served as nurses. So this is when we kind of see the development of the Red Cross with Clara Barton and um, the increase of women as, as nurses, surgeons involving that way. Although we also still have women serving as men, disguising themselves or also as spies. Um, however, it is not until the turn of the 20th century when the when, when the Army Nurse Corps is developed, and that is when women will be allowed to serve in the Army as an official capacity of nurses, which will grow during World War I and then again in World War II. It's not actually until World War II 
that the Women's Army Corps will be officially established in 1942, um, as this is kind of the first branch of women being allowed to serve. The Women's Army Corps will stay until 1978 when it is disbanded after the Vietnam War, and women are then integrated into the regular U.S. Army. It is not until the 1990s in the Gulf War when women in the Army will start to see combat, and it is not until 2013 when then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta uh, reverses a military rule and will now allow women to join all aspects of combat and fighting uh, in any position that they want. Okay, um, and then just really quickly on the side, because I've kind of shared lots of kind of cool facts, and we talked a little bit about spying. I just want to share a couple of things that are interesting. Um, George Washington was an avid uh, participant in spying methods. He had his own spy network called the Culper Spy Ring. Uh, his preferred method of spying was through invisible ink. Um, he and his friend John Jay invented their own invisible ink formula, um, which you could find out the letters if you used uh, milk, it would turn the ink black. Um, I'm not actually sure how they managed to get that to work. I've tried invisible ink recipes with lemon juice, but have not figured out how George Washington and John Jay did this. Uh, the other method that was kind of developed in line with the Revolutionary War is the encryption device, uh, which we will come to know as uh, sending messages that are encoded, so trying to crack them, trying to decode them. Um, it's actually invented by Thomas Jefferson. I have one here with me, he invents the cipher wheel, which you can see up there. It's comprised of 36 separate turning wooden wheels that have uh, letters on them. Uh, unfortunately, Jefferson makes it very, very, very complicated and it doesn't catch on, like it doesn't uh, catch on really at all. And even he gets so frustrated by it that he stops using it. Um, and no one has figured out how to like decode Jefferson's cipher wheel. It's most likely because the answer keys are lost, right? That he just didn't write them down or they were accidentally burned or no one held on to them. And so historians and cryptologists uh, don't really know how to decipher this. Uh, lucky for us though, we do develop um, easier methods of encryption. Um, we have a cipher disk that is developed and used by the Union Army in the Civil War, which looks like this one, right? It's a little bit easier to understand because only one wheel turns. And it is a device like this that is patented by the U.S. Army in 1922. Um, so just kind of a couple of cool little things related to the program. That has been a lot of talking. Um, so if anybody has any questions, questions, I will do my best to answer them. And then um, I will actually check the chat, but I did want to show everybody really quickly. Let me see if I can stop my share so I can pull it up. Um, I wanted to show you on our website how you can fill out a research request. Um, so you can do research requests through the National Archives. Um, our museum, however, is the largest uh, record of documentation pertaining to women that has served in the military. Um, unfortunately, I think in like the 60s or the 70s, the National Archives in St. Louis, where many of the records for women in the service were stored, caught on fire. And so unfortunately, many of the records were lost. Um, so if you have uh, a woman who served in any period that you're interested in and you're looking for military records, you can submit a research request to our museum. Um, and so please just send us an email or I can give you my email and fill it out as well. Uh, please be patient with us as we have a staff of three. Um, and so it is lots of people that are searching for your archive requests as well, but we are happy to search for it. Okay, now I am done. <laughs> um, Marilyn, I think your hand is up. Yes, I uh, understand. I, I'm shocked that you've got a name for the woman who was the major player in the Culper Ring, because from what I understand and from what I've read, that identity was never 
divulged and never written down. Yes. Yeah. So she is highly suspected to be that woman. Um, there's no, you're right. There's no like actual hard core evidence that says a hundred percent for sure. It's Anna Smith strong. Um, many historians believe that agent 355 is a woman and some of them believe that that woman is most likely Anna Smith strong. Um, I can put a link into where I kind of found that, but you're absolutely right. Um, that we don't really know for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. if, if it is her or not. Um, I mean, there's lots like the national security agency, um, believes that she was actually a member of the Culper spy ring. Um, Mm -hmm. it is true that regardless of whether or not she was, um, regardless of whether or not if she was in the Culper spy ring, she did use that method of spying. So she is really well known for just using her laundry to pass on information, which I just, I think is so clever, right? Because like, she's just out there doing like her laundry and the British are like, oh, there she is again. But I'll just send you, I'll put in the chat kind of the, uh, the websites that mention it. Um, There was another woman that was suspected of being, um, the woman too um she used to pass messages sewn in garments yes yes oh yes she did um i can't recall her name offhand i can't either <laughs> there's so many mary of them. mary or i want to say mary but i'm not sure uh yeah. i I'll have there's to- a there's, there's a so lot many. there are a lot of unanswered questions that is for sure <laughs> yes yeah and it it's a very much like this um you know for for the women in the revolution we get a little bit more um as we get closer right to the civil war mm-hmm. we know a little bit more about that but yes the revolutionary war even in general is like our kind of um least bit of collections that we have um but it is so, um, it's so interesting. There's so many interesting women that were involved in, in spying. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I'm sorry. It's not a very good answer. Like we say that she's thought to be, you know, this woman, but, uh, we'll probably never know. Right. I mean, the further we'll go, we can like really say it's most likely. Right. But it's not for Mm -hmm. sure. Um, Dreama. Yes, hi. Um, I have actually two questions. Uh, One of them relates to an ancestor. Her name was Barbara Susong, who they believe um, was possibly, probably a spy working with General Lafayette. Um, So there's, in her case, there's records of a man with a very, very similar name getting a payment and he's never shows up again (laughs) um so i don't know i I, you know i'm not sure how you can delve further into some of this and i'm wondering if there are ways um other than you know like looking through the payment records and and um some of the different pensions record pension records um so that's the first question then i'll get to the second one later so um this is probably not this is probably not going to be super helpful um what i'll do is i'll take her name and i'll run it through our database our archives um but probably um especially based on what you're telling me about the payments is it's probably going to be the pension um records if you're interested i can give you my email and we can um try it that way um the only other thing that i can offer um that uh, Suzanne mentioned in the beginning of this program, which is so true, is that trying to find things for free. So all of our programs are free, but because we are a government-run institution, we also have memberships to some of the more uh, sites that are inaccessible because you have to pay X amount. Um, so I can try also running information through it that way. But I would say, based on our own research, the best records are going to be the pension ones, um, the military, any sort of form of payment that was, that was shared back and forth. But I will, um, 
I will see what I, I can find out. I think the biggest um, key to her record is the fact that her husband, who also served in the in the war, and her son, but her husband specifically got a pension payment that was far in excess of what his rank. Um, Ooh, interesting. Why? And and so some people feel that she was actually being paid for her services through her husband. She so, most likely was. Yeah. So the um so and I have to look at the record to to confirm yeah. or confirm as best as I'm able. But when I talked a little bit about like Margaret Corbin or these women that were camp followers that were allotted their own rations, it was in their husband's name. So it was attached to whoever they were a part of the campsite with, um, which makes following the records really like tricky. Like they got their own food rations, but it, like it wouldn't have shown up that way. So the only time that the Continental Army really split was for pensions. And that's if the husband was was dead. Um, so like Deborah Sampson got her own pension um, because they're giving it to her when she was serving and she was unmarried at that time. So hers is easier to track because they attach it to Deborah Sampson and then she gets married and she has her married name. Um, Margaret Corbin's is easier to track as well because her husband is killed at this battle, right? So when they give her the pension, they're giving it solely to Margaret uh, Corbin. Um, but for many other women, like, so for say, if Margaret Corbin's husband had not been killed, she, all of the, like the rations they would have got would have gone to his name, John Corbin. So you would like compare it with a single soldier's rations compared to John. And if John's are doubles, it's like 99% is certain that it was his rations for his wife. Yeah, I'll look forward to sending you some information and, and seeing if you can do some research for it. That would be yeah, yeah, yep. Let me um let me put my let me put our email in here um for those of you that are interested. But yes, it's very um it's very interesting. There's um it's even kind of hard because we have a woman in our civil war program who files for a government pension. Um, and the reason we know about it is that she uh, happened to be a black woman that was enslaved and she escapes and she joins the military after the civil war is over. Um, but she files her pension under her, her assumed name, her hidden identity. Um, and it's very interesting because she's filing this pension as like a single woman masquerading as a single man trying to get her pension. Um, and then she applies for like a disability pension. Um, I think she's, I think she ends up being like denied, but that one's a little bit easier to track because there's more records of it. Um, because, you know, the Revolutionary War and the Continental Army was so haphazard, right? They're like trying to be a fully fledged army and they're trying to fight against, you know, the British. Uh, all of their records are kind of all over the place. Um, so it's very interesting, but yeah, I'll see what I can find out. It's so fascinating. Thank you. Um, and my second question, I think it'll be a quick answer, <laughs> is um, I have a picture in a family photograph of a woman who was in the service during World War II, at least that's the time frame I believe it's in, and I have no idea who she is. And I'm trying to, I'm wondering if there's a way to um, any facial recognition for photographs that you're aware of or ways to take particular names and, and kind of figure out, okay, could this be her? <laughs> mm. um, we can at our museum do, if you have like a couple of names that you think we can run the names through and if it pops up with images that we have, we can do it that way. We don't have a facial recognition software. I can ask, um, I can ask our curator if she knows anything about that, but um, if there is, like, we can't, uh, we can't do it through our museum, but if you have, like, names that you're like, we think it could be these 10 or these 50, you know, I'm happy to run those names through our software and see if anything pops up, and if it matches the same image, then we can do it that way, but I'd have to ask and see if there are any uh, software places that, that do that. All right, thank you. Yeah. And for the benefit of the recording, um, I just wanted to give Michaela's uh, email address out of the chat box. It's USA 
WM, I assume that stands for Women's Museum, education at gmail.com. So once again, USA, W-M-E-D-U-C-A-T-I-O-N at gmail.com. Yes, perfect. Yeah, and if you can't get it um, there, if they email you, uh, Suzanne, you're welcome to forward it to me or, or anything like that. Um, not a problem. Um, yeah, Louise, go ahead. Um, sorry, um, sorry about that. Couldn't couldn't find my cursor. What was the name of the black woman uh, in, who um, participated as a disguised um, male soldier? Oh, you, yes. you mentioned that, but you didn't mention the name. Yes, sorry. Her name is uh, Kathy Williams. Um, and when she disguises herself, she changes her name to William uh, Kathy. And I think like adds a name. She like, or adds like a letter. Um, but um, hold on. She's, if you Google it the right way, it like, it pops up. Yeah, it's, um, she was a Buffalo soldier. So that's the unit that she served in after the Civil War. Um, it is. It's sometimes spelled without an A after the N, but sometimes it is. So you can try it multiple spellings as Kathy, C-A-T-H-Y or C-A-T-H-A-Y. Um, and what she did is she just flipped her last name to her first name, which is kind of interesting. Can you give us um, samples of the different record sets that you have at your museum uh, that you use to research request? Yeah. Um, so most of our records are, once they're enlisting, are going to be all sorts of types of military records. So enlistment forms, um, medical records, discharge papers. Um, for lots of the women that we have is we have their own personal collections. Um, and that's because they were just so interested when the museum started, was going to open, they had put out a call to all, you know, female veterans that we want your collections. And so a lot of our archives are photographs, our newspapers, our letters that these women wrote, um, newspaper clippings that mention, you know, individual women. Um, we even have like photo albums that many wax themselves kind of kept. Uh, documenting their journey and then um, termed it in. But like, as for like actual records, they're all going to be government records. So um, and when they enlisted, when they discharged any paperwork that was, you know, if they had to file a grievance, if they had to go on leave, if they were pregnant and they were discharged out of the army is going to kind of look like that. So kind of our main, our main three are photos um, then military records, and then things like, you know, newspapers or diaries or letters. Um, I don't know if that, if that is helpful. I mean, we have some pretty, um, pretty cool ones. And then, I mean, we also like, those are our, our actual, like our documentation, but we have lots of uniforms, um, dog tags, things that women collected on their tours that they donated as well. Um, lots and lots of uniforms. Um, and then, of course, we have like military handbooks and stuff. So we um, have like handbooks that were issued to every new WAC from 1942 to when the WAC disintegrated to different, you know, like dress rules, books like that. Um, and what happens when someone fills out like an archival request, like I'm searching for this woman. This is her first name, last name. Um, I think she served in between these years or this war. We essentially run the name through our database to see like what pops up in our archive um, because our archival collections are actually put in by individual names. So then with that, it's like organized through topics. So like, uh, but World War II would be categorized by women. And then we have like boxes dedicated to that woman. And then we have separate boxes that are like dedicated to the wax in World War II, broadly speaking, if if that makes sense. Now, if somebody has something from a, a woman who served in the military that they would like to donate, what would be the procedure? Okay, so... Um, 
basically what you'll do is you can send me the same email. Um, I'll forward that request to our to our director, Tracy, who's our curator. Um, she'll probably reach out to you to 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 see about it. You can either, you know, send pictures of this is what it is, background. Um, most of the time people would be like, oh, I have a book about wax that was written in the 60s. And we're like, we we don't have room for that. Um, or if someone wants to donate a uniform that we already have 20 of, we're probably going to say um, no. But if it's about an individual woman uh, whose time we served and we don't have, like they've never donated their items or objects before, most likely we're gonna take that um, because we're kind of so far away. Um, if there's a way for someone to bring it in, we prefer that, but we take lots of things through like shipping, but it would really be, um, You'll have to speak with Tracy first because she'll look at it. She'll arrange a time over phone or Zoom to talk to you about it. Then if she agrees to take it, then you have to go through the process of acquisition, which is a little bit different because we're a governmental museum. So we're under um, the Army Enterprise. So we have to go through it um, on the government. And if you have ever worked with the government before, maybe from the National Archives, you know that the government tends to be particularly slow. Um, so if you are interested in donating, uh, just come in with lots of patience. <laughs> um, and that if anything gets held up, it's usually not on our end, but we are always happy to see and hear what someone says. Um, I also run typically our oral history collection. So we have a smaller set of that because we're just not generally equipped to take oral histories. Um, we try to organize it with the Library of Congress, but um, sometimes if there's a woman who served and she wants to share her story, I'll just simply set up an oral history through Zoom. And we do a lot of um, oral histories that way into our collections as well. And that maintains in-house with, with us. Okay, yes. Um, <laughs> if I answered your question in the chat, great. Um, if not, feel free to um, to send to send me an email of um, of anything particular. It just it really just depends on how much we have. Like if it's a uniform and we have ton of them, probably not because we can only like really put one uniform on display. But if there's certain paperwork that's really unique or interesting, and you want to talk about it. Um, um, if you want to talk about it more, we can set up an email or you can take pictures and scan it. And um, thank you for your service. I, I always try to ask that at the beginning and I for I forgot. So thank you for for sharing. And you know, if you're ever in the Richmond area, uh, let us know. We'd be happy to give you a personal tour of the museum and our collections. For the benefit of the of the new people who are just beginning their genealogy journey uh, here in the class, you mentioned the term wig. Can you define that for the people who are beginners? Oh, wig. Yes, wig is um, a political party uh, that comes out um, in the American Revolution, basically turns into what is the Federalist versus the Anti-Federalist movement, which then essentially merges into what will become our two political parties. Um, but it's kind of hard to tell because in the revolution and then the civil war, there's like six different political parties kind of hopping all over the place. Uh, so Whig supporters at the time of the American revolution would have been heavily for, for the Patriots, for the Continental Army, um, other, I'm sorry, I'm like trying, I'm trying to look at the chat. Yes, so um, the Cathay Williams as well, um, we don't have access to her parentage because she was born into her born into slavery most likely so her parents would have uh, probably died as slaves or there's no record for it um and then wig essentially delves into what would now be considered the modern conservative party um i try to stay away from that because that's like saying oh the the Democrats of 1780 are the same as Democrats today, right? Political parties, of course, evolve and adapt to the time and circumstance in their in, at that they're in. Um, but the Whig Party will essentially merge into our more modern political parties, if that helps. 
the uh, I'm looking up in the Oxford uh, Dictionary, and it says an American colonist who supported the American Revolution as well as part of the definition. Oh, interesting. Yes, yeah. Um, there's so there's so many terms. It's so hard to um, keep uh, keep track of them. Yes. So I guess you also would have supported the American Revolution because I mean you can use a lot of those terms interchangeably too. Like I switch between Patriot and Continental Army, um, and then you know, and I try to say that because technically they're not Americans yet, but they'll become American soldiers. Okay, so do we have any more questions from the class? Let's give it a second. Unmute your microphone and ask uh, Michaela directly. And Michaela, I, I was looking uh, to find the uh, DAR numbers for all those women, but I could only find a certain amount of them. Yeah, I I saw that. I thought that was really interesting too on um, just the ones that you were really, I found it really interesting that Margaret Corbin didn't have a number. And I believe that's because they didn't have any children. I'm, I'm uh, not I'm not 100% sure, but I am almost positive that um, when she followed her husband, uh, they they did not have children at this time. And because he was killed during the war, Margaret never um, never remarried. So I think that's the answer for why Margaret doesn't have a number. Um, and I'm not sure why Anna Smith Strong doesn't. Um, I am have a, I had a feeling Ann Bates wouldn't because I she moves back to London after the war is over. Um, and so I'm pretty sure that any children they have also moved back to the UK. Uh, but yeah, the Anna so Strong one was interesting too. But yes, um, I can put in the numbers into the chat if anyone's interested. Um, but you have them as well. So that's kind of, um, it's pretty cool that they were able to, to pop up like that. Okay. Now, before we say goodbye, uh, if the class doesn't have any other questions, can you tell me uh, who is the typical group that comes through your your uh, your museum? Are they DAR people? Are they SAR people? You know, who are they? Um. So typically, our largest uh, group that comes in will be um, Army veterans. Um, that are really interested that have done archival collections research and they just kind of want to learn more about the story. Um, outside of that, it's just other, you know, adult groups that are really kind of interested in, in the history or have a connection to military history and they kind of want to learn. Um, we used to do a few school groups and that kind of went off when COVID hit. Um, we're just starting back up again, but those are usually local schools in the area. And they usually come because they're doing um, some type of research either on the revolution or World War II. Um, we do a lot of soldier training as well. So we'll get a lot of army uh, groups that will come through that will do uh, gender integration training with us through the museum. Um, but for the most part, our adult groups are just some, just a group that has some interest or connection to the military, and it can be broadly beyond uh, genealogy groups, DRA, SRA, um, veteran groups, um, people who are kind of interested in that. We've had a lot of um, recently people coming to the museum after it was renamed um, who are interested in doing um, archival research on um, more minority groups that served as women, so either uh, Black women or Hispanic women or um, Asian American women uh, have started to come in to kind of do research or are interested in things like that. So kind of a whole um, collection, but it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to one group. Okay, and what about recommended reading? Do you have like, I seen, it sounded like there was a lot of interest in here in the class on at least some of the women you went, uh, went over. Now you did mention Prudence and the, uh, the Women Minutes, but are there any other books that you would recommend? Yes, so um, there's a lot of interesting ones on Deborah Sampson um, that have kind of come out. I would say probably the most recent one, like the newest one is called Deborah Sampson and it's, written oh I have to I have to type it because I will mess up her name um in the chat 
it came out in 2012. So that one is pretty, um, is relatively new. Um, there is another one that came out in 1977 called I'm Deborah Sampson by Patricia Clapp. And that's just a well-known one. Um, Deborah Sampson, I think most of these women don't like have their kind of their own books, but there's a lots of historical fiction that are kind of written about them. I actually, I have the titles, so let me put them in the chat. Um, and if, um, I think somebody else had their hand up. So if you want to pose your question while I put these into the chat, we can do that as well. Uh, yes, this is uh, Louise again. You mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, the name change. Could you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hopefully everybody is a little bit aware that uh, there are nine army bases uh, located in the South from Virginia all the way down that are, uh, that were going, undergoing a name change by the Department of Defense, uh, Department of the Army, as kind of along this whole debate of like removing Confederate statues, uh, that we should no longer have military bases named after uh, Confederate leaders or generals. And so it's been an ongoing process. They essentially created something called the Naming Commission, um, which was just made up of a different group of of people in the military, um, in the government that were going to submit kind of naming requests and then they would decide on what they were going to be named. So it was a whole process. There's actually a website for it that I'll drop into the chat as well. That is about, um, that is about kind of the process through it, right? So it took a couple of years. There were names that were submitted um, and then they were all kind of decided upon. So Fort Lee, um, which if you think that it was named after Robert E. Lee, is actually one of the few bases that sh its name is from two people. Um, so the first part, Greg, is for Arthur Greg. He was the first Black uh, three-star general in the Quartermaster Corps. He is also the only member that is still living to have a base named after him. He is 94 years old. He lives in Richmond, somewhere over there. Um, and so he is the first part of our name. And our second part is Adams, and that is for Charity Adams that I think I mentioned at the beginning of our program when uh, Suzanne was introducing me. And Charity Adams is well known for being the leader of the only um all female, all black unit that is deployed to Europe uh, during World War II. They are called the Six Triple Eight, um, and they will get sent to Europe as part of a postal battalion um, to clear out the backlog of mail. And so she uh, shares her name with Arthur Gregg. Uh, so both two um, very important African American members of the military that we kind of like to say that as Charity Adams' career was ending, Arthur Gregg's was beginning. And so now uh, the fort is named after them, Fort Gregg Adams. And then let me see if I can find that link and drop it in the chat because it's pretty interesting um, how, they, how they go about it. And you can also see, you know, um, what the other bases are called, kind of things like that. And just as a fun fact for um, people who are interested in women's history, uh, Fort A.P. Hill in Virginia uh, is being renamed Fort Mary Walker after Dr. Mary Walker uh, from the Civil War, who is the only woman to ever receive the Medal of Honor. Uh, so I dropped that in there. These are kind of some of the best books that are out there. I love the spy soldiers, careers, and saboteurs about women of the American Revolution. It's just really interesting um, as well. And then if you just Google any of these women, um, there's a whole slew of information out there. The American Battlefield Trust has a great uh, link of, of different books, of different sources, primary sources on these women as well. And for the benefit of the recording, let me just uh, reiterate those titles again. Deborah Sampson by Marilyn Comchock. Um, 
Margaret Corbin by Aaron Wilson, Spy Soldiers, Furriers and Saboteurs by K.M. Bald Vogel. I believe I pronounced that right. Perfect, okay. Yes. All right, any other questions for our guest speaker? I'm gonna see if our library has these books and if so, I will highlight them in our book of the week. Okay, we'll just give it a few more seconds to see if anyone else has a question. This is um, Dreama. It's, it's not really a question, but I wanted to say that I read um, A Girl Called Samson by Amy Harmon. And it's yeah, more that's... of a fictionalized view of her story, of her, you know, life. Um, it was very uh, informative, interesting, um, took some liberties, but, you know, they're to be expected when you're fictional, when you're trying to write a, a story about somebody you don't really know. <laughs> Yeah, the the fiction ones are, I mean, I read those too. Like, I think I read, um, I think I read really interesting ones too when I was younger about Molly Pitcher. Um, Revolutionary Mothers by Carol Birkin is also really interesting as well. Um, there's so many out there. I mean, I could give you a whole list of books. Um, I can but, recommend Revolutionary Mothers too, although it starts out a little slow. <laughs> yeah, yes. I did try to be like careful about what I recommend because like I I'm a historian by training and sometimes I'm like the stuff that like I think is like I think is interesting might be dry to other people but like even if I find it dry I'm like oh no that wasn't a good one. Um but there's there's so many um there's so many interesting ones. There's one too that talks specifically about um what is it called? It's called Glory Passion in Principle. Um, it's by Melissa, somebody, I don't know her last name off the top of my head, but that one's very interesting as well. Does your website have a recommended reading list? Um, we have a recommended reading list. I don't know if it's on our website. Um, let me try to find it from our Google Drive and I'll email it to Suzanne if I can locate it. Um, we updated our reading list, but it has to go through the government. It has to go through the Department of Defense before it can be posted on our website. So if you're ever looking for the most up-to-date information, it's not going to be on our website, um, which is actually not great. It's, it's a real problem, um, but that's why our reading list is not on our website because it has to get approved by the government before we can make uh, changes to it. Okay, well, I'll look forward to that. I'll, I'll pass yeah. it out to the students uh, when, I, when we get to Okay. Them. That's fine. I understand. Okay, we'll just give the class on another few seconds just for any last minute thoughts or questions. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, Michaela, I can't say thank you enough for your, your time and your expertise. And uh, once again, thank you for allowing us to record. It'll take some time for our marketing department to get it posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, but once it is, I'll let you know. And uh, once again, we really, really thank you for your time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys uh, so much for listening and asking great questions. And feel free to reach out if you have any further questions. Have a great rest of your Friday. Okay. And I'd like to invite the class to stay for the second half of class. Uh, any of those who would like to sign off at this point in time, you're more than welcome to. Just click on the red in button and that'll take you out. But once again, we go on for another couple hours. So I hope you'll stay around and stay uh, to learn about the second half of class. Bye-bye, Michaela. Bye.